and welcome. Caring for You Nursing Services is proud to present EKG Strips for the NCLEX, presented by Annalise Garrison. In this presentation, you will be able to do the following. You will be able to understand the basic reading of a typical 6-second EKG strip. You will understand the typical P, Q, R, S, T, and sometimes U components of an EKG strip. You will be able to interpret on an EKG normal sinus rhythm, bradycardia, tachycardia, supraventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, ventricular fibrillation, heart blocks, and asystole. If you have purchased this presentation, you will have access to a 20-question simulated NCLEX quiz. Now, let us begin. Let me just start by saying that this is not going to turn you into expert telemetry nurses. This course is not designed to do that. What this course is designed to do is to help you understand and interpret EKG strips for the NCLEX. You're going to get enough information that I believe will be helpful for you to pass the EKG strip portion of the NCLEX. So the first step in understanding how to read an EKG is to understand the components of the heart waves. Now what I mean by the components is what is called the P wave, the QRS complex, the T wave, and sometimes the U wave. So if you look on the slide here, you will see the SA node and the AV node. The SA node and the AV node make up the activity of the P wave. Then we see here the Purkinje fibers and the QRS complex. So during normal atrial depolarization, the main electrical vector is directed from the SA node towards the AV node and spreads from the right atrium to the left atrium. This turns into the P wave on an EKG. So the P wave represents atrial activity. Now let's talk about the QRS complex. The pathological Q waves are a sign of previous myocardial infarction. Now on a normal EKG, you would expect to see a slightly inverted Q wave, just slightly inverted. All right, this will be the baseline for the Q. But if you see a very inverted Q wave, this is a sign of a previous myocardial infarction. Q waves are not an early sign of myocardial infarction, but generally take several hours to days to develop. Once pathological Q waves develop, this is a sign of myocardial infarction. Now we have a baseline for the Q wave and once it goes past that baseline, then this is evidence that a myocardial infarction has occurred. However, if the myocardial infarction is reperfused early, uh, for example, as a result of a percutaneous coronary intervention, stunned myocardial tissue can recover and pathologic Q waves disappear. In all other situations, they usually persist. So the P wave represents atrial activity. The QRS complex represents ventricular activity. The QRS complex reflects the rapid depolarization or stimulation of the right and left ventricles. 
they have a large muscle mass compared to the atrium so the QRS complex usually has a much larger amplitude than the P wave. Now let's talk about another important wave and that is the T wave. The T wave represents the repolarization or the recovery of the ventricles when the blood leaves the ventricle and goes back up into the atria. Okay? The interval from the beginning of the QRX complex to the apex of the T wave is referred to as the absolute refractory period. The last half of the T wave is referred to as the relative refractory period or we can also call that the vulnerable period. All right. So to summarize, the P wave represents atrial activation. The PR interval is the time from the onset of that atrial activation to the onset of the ventricular activation. The QRS complex represents ventricular activation. The QRS du duration is the duration of the ventricular activation. The ST to T wave represents the ventricular repolarization. The QT interval is the duration of the ventricle activation and recovery. The U wave probably represents after depolarizations in the ventricles. Sometimes we do see U wave activity. The U wave is caused by the repolarization of the interventricular septum. They normally have a low amplitude and even more often complete are completely absent. They always follow the T wave. If they are too prominent, you should suspect hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, or hyperthyroidism. Those are the three things you would suspect if you see a U wave. Now, if you purchased this presentation, at this point you would be able to take a basic 10 question online quiz. So, let me ask you a question. This I would call an NCLEX alert, okay? This is a question that would be on the NCLEX, besides the actual EKG strips that you have to look at. You have been pulled to the telemetry unit for the day. The monitor informs you that the client has developed a prominent U wave. Which laboratory value should you check immediately? Sodium, potassium, magnesium or calcium. This is not a select all that apply question. You only are to select one. So should you check the sodium, the potassium, the magnesium, or the calcium? And the answer is potassium. Now I just got done telling you that if you see a U wave you see hyperthyroidism, hypercalcemia, and or hypokalemia. So why didn't we pick D, calcium? And the reason why we did not choose calcium as an answer is because calcium plays a bigger role in the bones of your body. It's potassium that plays a bigger role in the effect on the heart. So this is why the most immediate choice answer would be B. Now let us continue to learn about the basics of heart rate. If you look here on the presentation you will see some big boxes and five little boxes. This is used to, to measure the exact rate. Each large box on a six-second EKG strip 
is 0 0.2 seconds. In between the larger boxes, we have five small boxes. So each large box is made up of five small boxes. Each small box has an interval of 0 0.04 seconds. So this is how the timing works on an EKG strip. Now there's two ways to find the rate on an EKG strip. There's actually several rate ways, but for the purpose of the NCLEX, I'm only going to discuss two waves. If the heart rate is regular, we can use the 300 method, and I will discuss that. If the heart rate is irregular, we can use the 6 second method. Now, looking at the next slide, we see that there are two and a half boxes between the R to R interval. Remember the QRS complex. All right, we're looking at the R to R interval. You can't see it well on the slide here, but on this slide, there are two and a half big boxes from the R on the first wave to the R on the second wave. So knowing this, we take 300 divided by 2.5 blocks and we come up with a heart rate of 120 beats per minute. This is how we do it when the rate when the rhythm actually is regular. When the rhythm of the heart is irregular, we use what I call, and everyone else calls it too actually, the six second method. And the six second method can be used, like I said, with an irregular rhythm to estimate the rate. Both of these methods are just estimations all right. So to figure it out this way, when the heart rate is irregular, in this slide it looks pretty regular, but let's just say for the sake of demonstration that this is an irregular rate. So you would count the R to R intervals in a six second strip, and then you would times it by 10. So in this example, there is eight R intervals. We take the 8, we times it by 10, and we arrive at an estimated 80 beats per minute. So this is the basics of the heart rate. Now let's talk about the basics of the heart rhythm. Sinus rhythm is the normal rhythm, so you need to be able to distinguish this from all others. As I mentioned before, the impulse begins in the SA node and travels through the AV junction and the bundle of his into the ventricles. This is what is known as sinus rhythm. So, when looking at rhythm, we need to look at five components that enable us to interpret an EKG strip. We need to look at the rate. Is it regular? If it's regular, we use the 300 method, and if it's irregular, we use the 6 second method. That's how we figure out the rate. The regularity. We want to look at whether it's tachycardia, bradycardia, and or whether the regularity is regular or irregular. We want to look at the P wave. The P wave should always come before the QRS complex and represents atrial activity. We want to look at the PR interval, the duration of that interval. We want to look at the QRS complex. We want to look at its shape, size, duration. And the QRS complex represents ventricular activity. 
And we all also want to look at the QT interval. We want to look at the time or the duration of that interval. So now that we learned about the basics of heart rhythm and the basics of heart rate, this is what I'm going to explain to you when we look at the, EK, the following EKG strips. And that will be normal sinus rhythm, bradycardia, and tachycardia. This all has, when we talk about normal sinus rhythm, bradycardia, and tachycardia, we're usually talking about the ventricular rate. There's also, and I think it's important to discuss, the supraventricular tachycardia. This is the rate and rhythm that's happening in the atria. All right. I'm also going to discuss atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, ventricular fibrillation, heart blocks, and asystole. These are the eight nine sorry nine basic components that you will see on the NCLEX. We all know what a systole is. All right, that's a flat line, but I'll still go over it for the sake of the NCLEX. All right. So moving along, let's talk about normal sinus rhythm. The criteria for a normal sinus rhythm is a P wave before each QRS with an interval of 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds in duration. All right. So in other words, the P wave should be only three small blocks to one large block in duration. The QRS width of should be 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. So, if we look at the QRS interval, the width of that interval should be only one small block to three small blocks in width. Okay, are you following me? Good. The QT interval, all right, if you look here, the QT, when I talk about the QT interval, I'm talking about the beginning of the Q, to the apex of the T. When I talk about intervals, I'm talking about time. When I'm talking about segments or complexes, I'm actually talking about the actual wave. But when I mention interval, I'm talking about time. So, from the Q wave to the apex or the end of the T wave, it should be less than 0 0.40 seconds. This means it should be less than 2 large boxes because each large box is what? 0 0.2 seconds. So two large boxes would be 0 0.4 se seconds. So you want the QT interval to be to be or less than 0 0.4 seconds. The normal rate for sinus rhythm is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now once you understand this, you're going to be able to understand uh, tachycardia and bradycardia. So again, the P wave should be 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds in duration. As I mentioned, either three small blocks or one large block. And that's all the PR interval should be. The QRS complex, the width of that should be 0 0.04 seconds to 0 0.12 seconds. This means that the width of the QRS complex should be one small box and no wider than three small blocks. Okay? The QT interval uh, should be less than 0 0.40 seconds. Again, so it should be 
two large boxes or less no more than that and again of course normal sinus rhythm is 60 to 100 beats per minute this is what we need to know about sinus bradycardia the P wave the QRS complex and the QT intervals are all the same as normal sinus rhythm that I just explained to you except that the rate is less than 60 beats per minute that's the only difference between sinus bradycardia on an EKG strip and normal sinus rhythm now let's look at a cardiac strip so that we can look at it better we see here that it fits all the criteria you really can't see it this is really too small for this presentation on this video but if you buy it you can see it the P wave there's a P wave before each QRS complex and it does fit the criteria in this particular example it looks like it's only one to about two small blocks so it fits the criteria uh, the QRS width seems to be only one small block so that fits the criteria of 0 0.04 seconds alright and the QT interval the bottom of the Q to the end of the T wave is about two boxes but how do we know this is sinus bradycardia because if we count the R to R interval that's the peak of the QRX QRS complex there's one two three four so this makes it 4 times 10 is 40 beats per minute this is an estimate of the rate now in a 6 second strip I want you to see there's a little notch up here these little black notches up at the top where I have sinus bradycardia each one of these notches represents a 3 second strip so notch to notch is three seconds and then from the middle of this EKG strip to the end of this EKG strip there's another notch but it doesn't go the EKG strip st starts to con continue right now if th there was a P wave and a QRS interval outside of this black notch we would not count it alright you only count what is in between these little marks that represents three seconds and in this particular example it's three seconds plus three seconds this makes it a six second EKG strip alright now we talked about normal sinus rhythm sinus bradycardia let's talk about sinus tachycardia sinus tachycardia is the exact same as normal sinus rhythm and bradycardia when it comes to the PR interval when it comes to the QRS duration and when it comes to everything else except that the beats are faster sinus tachycardia is if the beat is within uh, uh, is 101 actually 101 to 150 beats per minute this would what this is what would be known as sinus tachycardia on an EKG strip everything else is the same as normal sinus rhythm except for the rate so on bradycardia it's all the same as normal sinus rhythm except for the rate less than 60 for sinus tachycardia everything is the same as normal sinus rhythm except for the rate the rate being 101 to 150 beats per minute 
Now let's look at an EKG strip of sinus tachycardium. The PR interval fits the criteria. The QRS duration fits the criteria. The only difference is the rate. And this particular strip, we count the rate by counting the R's. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We take 12, we times that by 10, and in this particular EKG strip, we have a heartbeat of 120 beats per minute. All right. Now, let's talk about supraventricular tachycardia. So far, we've talked about activity in the ventricles. But we do sometimes ha have activity always we have activity in the atria and this is what's known as SVT supraventricular tachycardia SVT is a rapid heart rate originating above the ventricle tissue two common types of SVT are atrial ventricular reciprocating tachycardia and AV nodal reentrant tachycardia this is not important to know for the NCLEX, but it is important here so that you'll understand the concept of what supraventricular tachycardia actually is. All right, A person experiencing SVT may feel their heart rate go from 60 to plus 200 beats per minute or more. It typically also has a sudden termination from the fast heart rate back to normal sinus rhythm. So this is what supraventricular tachycardia is. This, on the next slide, is what supraventricular tachycardia looks like. The rhythm is regular. The rate is 150 to 220 on the slide here I have 140 to 220 but you know every book will say th something a little different as long as it's close it's fine so I'm going to say the rate is 150 to 220 beats per minute the QRS duration is usually normal okay the P wave is often buried in the preceding T wave why is that because the P wave represents atrial activity, right? And the T wave also represents atrial activity. This is why the P wave is often buried in the preceding T wave. The PR interval depends on the site of the supraventricular pacemaker. Impulses stimulating the heart are not being generated by the sinus node but are instead coming from a collection of tissue around and involving the atrioventricular node. So, the PR interval depends on where the heart is being stimulated on the site of the supraventricular pacemaker, right? So, because the P wave and the T wave represent atrial activity the P wave is often buried in the T wave when we look at a SVT all right now let's talk about sinus arrhythmia what is sinus arrhythmia when the pattern becomes irregular with normal intervals it is sinus arrhythmia so again, the sinus arrhythmia fits all the criteria of the normal sinus rhythm. The PR interval is the same. The QRS duration is the same. It has the regular, the normal sinus rhythm beats per minute, 60 to 100. But now the difference is that the regular rhythm 
is regular with periodic irregularity. If we look at this slide, slide 28, we see we have a PQRST interval, right? Then we have a slight long, prolonged period before the next P wave. And then we have a three PQRST inter intervals, right? Then there's another slight pause. And now the next three is slightly longer. So we can see the periodic irregularity in this EKG strip. This is, if you saw this on the Aniclex, this is what would be known as sinus arrhythmia. So when we talk about the rate, remember what I told you, this becomes very important when you're looking at uh, arrhythmia, uh, regular versus irregular. When the rhythm is regular, the heart rate is 300 divided by the large number of squares between the QRS complexes. For example, in this EKG strip, you would take 300 divided by 3.5 and you come up with 85.7 or 86 beats per minute. Don't forget, these are just estimates of the rate. If you need to be precise, you'll have a tool where you, that you can use to be precise. Uh, when the rhythm is irregular, we want to do on the like the bottom strip here, like the one I just showed you. To estimate the rate, you want to count the number of R waves in a six second strip and multiply that by 10. For example, in this strip, we have seven R complexes, right? So 7 times 10 equals 70 beats per minute. Now notice here that the we do we actually have 8 R's, but that last R on the end of the strip is outside of the 6 second strip. So this last one on the end here would not count. You only count what's on in between this notch to the six second notch. This is all you this is all the R's you count. So this would be seven times ten is seventy beats per minute. You don't count that last QRS complex because it's outside of the six second strip. Now let's talk about atrial fibrillation. It is possible for the atria to depolarize a bit earlier than normal. This is actually quite common, and this is actually called premature atrial contraction. This also happens with the ventricles. When the ventricles depolarize earlier than, than normal, we would call that premature ventricular contraction, or PVC. In atrial fibrillation, we have a normal upright P wave. We have the usual QRS complex, one small block to three small blocks, right? But what we want to know about atrial fibrillation, this describes a condition in which the atrial tissue randomly generates action potentials from many different regions. Physically, the atrial muscles appear to quiver they look like jello. There is no noticeable P waves and the overall rhythm is irregularly reg irregular. Do you understand what I mean by irregularly irregular? Good. And you can see here that there's no regular irregularity in this strip. Uh, we have the first PQRST, and then we have the second complex, the third complex. You see how it's all over the place. It's not regular at all. As a matter of fact, it's irregularly irregular.
The key to recognizing AFib are the narrow QRSs and the irregularly irregular rhythm. Another important thing that I want to show you for the NCLEX is atrial flutter. When we look at atrial flutter, the regularity, the atrial rate is regular. All right. The ventricular rate will usually be regular, but only if the AV node conducts the impulses in a consistent manner. Otherwise, the ventricular rate will be irregular. In atrial flutter, the rate can be anywhere between 250 to 350 beats per minute. The ventricular rate depends on conduction through the AV node into the ventricles. The P wave will be well defined and have a sawtooth pattern to them. The, the width of the QRS complex will be within normal limits, less than 0 0.12 seconds. Atrial flutter or variable block. This is extremely common among A flutter patients. There can be as few as a single P wave or as many as six or more P waves between each QRS complexes. So that's a lot. Let me repeat that. Atrial flutter, we, we, see, we see what is known as a, a variable block when there's anywhere from one to six or more P waves between each QRS complex. Remember this. See here, we have one, we have one, two, three, four P waves between each QRS complex in this particular strip. This is what is known as atrial flutter. The clinical significance of AFib and A flutter is twofold. First, because the atria generally don't have time to fill completely, the preload to the ventricles is reduced and cardiac output suffers. Second, perhaps even more dangerous is the erratic and turbulent blood flow caused by the erratic contraction and relaxation of the atrial walls. In the turbulence, blood can form small clots which may lodge in small vessels. If a clot, known as a thrombus, right, is released into the cerebral tissues, it can cause a stroke. So this is the clinical significance of atrial flutter. Now let's look at ventricular fibrillation. As far as regularity goes, there is no regularity to the rhythm because there are no complexes or, or waves present that are able to be analyzed. All right, the rate. There is no measurable rate. As far as the P wave goes, there's no P waves present. And as far as the QRS complex there is no QRS complex. So when you see this, this is what is known as atrial fibrillation. The heart is just beating too rapidly that you can't see anything. A patient usually will be unconscious as blood is not pumped to the brain. So what do we do with ventricular fibrillation? we quickly defibrillate this person. Now we're going to talk about heart blocks. Heart block can occur anywhere in the conduction system beginning with the sinoatrial connections to the AV junction, the bundle branches, and ending in the distal ventricular Purkinje fibers. Disorders of conduction may manifest as slowed conduction. If you have slowed conduction, slow conduction, 
This is first degree heart block. If you have intermittent conduction failure, this is second degree heart block. If you have no conduction at all, if you have conduction failure, this is third degree heart block. So, when we talk about hard heart blocks, we often talk about the different degrees of the heart block. Now, when I talk about second degree heart block, we can break that down into two varieties, type 1 and type 2. In type 1, there is a decremental conduction, which means that conduction velocity progressively slows down until failure of the conduction occurs. That's type 1 in second degree heart block. Type 2 in second degree heart block means that there is all or none. The term exit block is used to identify conduction delay or failure immediately distal to a pacemaker site. The sinoatrial or the, the SA block is an exit block. Now let me explain. So we have the SA block. This is usually second degree SA block. This is the only degree of SA block that can be recognized on the surface of an EKG. So if you see this kind of block, this we automatically know is second degree. An example would, would be intermittent conduction failure between the sinus node and the right atrium. There are two types, but since sinus arrhythmia may be hard to di differentiate. It is not clinically important. Now let's look at a sinoatrial block EKG strip. You'll see it. You'll see that the P to P intervals are usually shortened until one P wave is dropped. We see that right in the middle here. We see no P wave at all, right? We see everything is stopped right here. There's a prolonged. In type 2 SA block, the P to P intervals are an, an sorry, the P to P intervals are an exact multiple of the sinus cycle and are regular before and after the dropped P wave. Again, we see that right in the middle here. Regular, drop, regular, right? This usually occurs transiently and produces no symptoms and may occur in healthy patients with increased vagal tone. It may also be found in CAD, inferior MI, and digitalis toxicity. So that is the SA block. All right. Having said that, let's look at the atrioventricular or AV block on slide 37 here. Possible sites of an AV block are the AV node, which is the most common. You see the AV junction conduction right here? This is the most common. The bundle of his, which is um, a, um, not quite as common, which is right, which is right under the AV junction conduction and the bundle branch divisions all right you see where it divides off into the right and left ventricle in present in the presence of an already existing complete bundle branch block this happens in the bundle branch if there's already a block all right so now here in slide 38, we have an example of first degree AV block. Electrical impulses are slowed through the AV node, but there is still one to one conduction to the ventricles with delay. Rarely do patients exhibit symptoms from this condition, and it may be a normal finding in well conditioned athletes reflecting a high vagal tone. Medications can also contribute to this finding. The classic 
EKG finding of this condition is a prolonged PR interval. First degree blocks are the least troublesome. So if you see a first degree block on an EKG strip, we don't normally worry about it. This is the least troublesome. It can lead to second degree AV blocks, but for the NCLEX, this would not be your first pick, your first patient you would see. So with the atrial ventricular blocks, as far as the, uh, the measuring of the intervals go, the PR interval should be between three small blocks to one block, to one large block. If not, you have some form of a ble of AV block. The QRS interval should be less than three small blocks. If not, you have a bundle branch block. You see why it was important for me to show you how to find the rate at the beginning of this presentation? Let's look at a strip of a second degree AV block type 1. In, a, in the second degree AV block type 1, there is a progressive delay in the conduction of each subsequent atrial impulse reaching the AV node to the ventricles. Finally, an atrial impulse is blocked in the AV node and fails to conduct to the ventricles, leading to a skipped beat. The 12 lead EKG manifests this condition as a prolonged PR interval with a resultant P wave not followed by a QRS. And we can see that here. One, two, three, no QRS, and then the P wave starts back up again. All right. So that is an example of a atrioventricular second degree AV block type 1. In a second degree AV block type 2, there does not appear to be a delay in the AV nodule conduction on the surface of the EKG strip with a normal PR interval. However, look at the strip here, there will be episodic atrial impulses that are blocked in the diseased AV node and do not conduct to the ventricles. Now, if we have no ventricular activity, what are we going to have? We're not going to have a QRS complex, right? Because the QRX complex represents ventricular activity. But if the AV node is blocked, there will be no QRS complex. It will drop, like you see in this strip here. This condition is less common than type 1 AV block and is substantially more serious. All right. So, this is what a typical second degree AV block type 2 is. Remember type 2 is no conduction. Right? So, the rate is variable, all right? The P wave is normal with consistent P to P intervals. The QRS complex is usually widened. That means longer than 0 0.12 seconds because this is usually associated with a bundle branch block. As far as the conduction goes, the PR interval may be normal or prolonged but it is constant until one P wave is not conducted to the ventricles. And the rhythm is usually regular with AV conduction ratios constant. This block usually occurs below the bundle of his and may progress into a higher degree block. So this is very dangerous, right? It can occur after an acute anterior MI due to the damage in the bundle 
branches. It is more serious than type 1 block. All right, type 2, of course, is more serious than type 1. And the treatment is usually artificial pacemaker. All right. Now, moving on to slide 43, we're going to talk about the third degree AV block. This is a complete heart block or a complete AV block. The atrial impulses are completely blocked from reaching the ventricles with an electrical disconnection of the two chambers. There may be a secondary yet slower beating site in the ventricles that take over the pacemaker function of the heart. This condition is dangerous as this backup pacemaker site is not reliable and complete loss of cardiac electrical activity with cardiac arrest will be imminent. A pacemaker is generally warranted in situations that are not secondary to other medical conditions that may resolve or improve. For example, heart attacks, medications, or electrolyte disturbances. So if you look at this slide here, slide 44, you'll see a picture of an EKG strip that is of a third degree AV block. Remember that a third degree block is a complete block. So when we look at this slide, we will see that the, the rate is usually normal. The ventricular rate is usually less than 70 beats per minute and the atrial rate is always faster than the ventricular rate okay so the P wave will always be faster than the QRS wave as far as the rate goes the P wave is normal with the constant P to P interval but it's not married to the QRS complex in other words it's going to be different because the atrial rate is faster than the ventricular rate All right. The QRS complex may be normal or widened depending on where the pacemaker is located in the conduction system. It, depending on where the conduction system is what it's using as a pacemaker, right? The conduction is atrial and ventricular activities are unrelated due to the complete block of the atrial impulses to the ventricle. And the rhythm is irregular. Slide four, in slide 45 here, we see that a complete block of the atrial impulse occurs at the AV junction. Common bundle or bilateral bundle branches. Okay? Another pacemaker distal to the blocks, like I just said, takes over in order to activate the ventricles or the ventricular stand will still occur. This may be caused by digitalis toxicity, an acute infection, an MI, and a degeneration of the conductive tissue. Treatment usually includes an external pacemaker, atropine for acute symptomatic episodes, and permanent pacing for chronic complete heart block. All right, so third degree heart block, usually the person has a pacemaker. Alright, so to summarize the AV blocks, because this was a lot we talked about, in first degree blocks they are generally benign. They are characterized by a constant PR interval and greater than 0 0.2 seconds. The rhythm is otherwise normal. The rates may range from bradycardias to tachycardias with a full degree of variation in between. Ordinarily, there is no symptoms associated with first degree heart blocks. Now remember when we talk about second degree heart blocks, they could be broken down into two types. Type 1 in a second degree type 1 block, this rhythm is distinguished by a repeating cycle of increasing PR intervals. As the interval gets longer, a P wave is either not conducted, i.e. there is no QRS, or the P wave is simply dropped, remember? 
The cycle then is repeated again. Typically, the R to R intervals become shorter until the beat is dropped. Type 1 blocks are generally not dangerous. The patient may complain of palpitations or skipped beats. All right, then we have the second degree type 2. This rhythm can be recognized by a consistent R, sorry, a consistent PR interval and frequently non-conductive P waves. QRS complexes may appear widened depending on the location of the block. Wide QRS complexes indicate that the ventricles are depolarizing from an action potential in the ventricular tissue rather than from or above the AV junction. Generally speaking, type 2 blocks are not a good sign. They have a tendency to worsen, leading to third degree blocks. So type 1 blocks, we have a slow conduction. Remember, type 2 blocks, we have a intermittent conduction. Remember what I said about 10 slides back? And then third degree block is no conduction. All right? Third degree heart block is far by far the most dangerous. There is absolutely no conduction through the AV node. And why does this happen? Well, this is due to the automat automaticity of each region of the heart. The atria beat are their intrinsic rate, 60 to 80 beats per minute. And the ventricles, which are completely isolated from the atria, beat at their slower rate of 20 to 40 beats per minute. This is in third degree heart block. The QRS complexes will often be wide depending on the origin of the ventricular action potential. They may remain narrow. The P to P interval and the R to R interval will each be regular and consistent. The P to P interval will be faster than the R to R and there will be no relation between the two. In other words, the atrial activity will be faster than the ventricular activity, the, the atrial activity being the P to P interval, right? And the ventricular activity being represented by the R and there will be no relation between the two. It's important to remember that third degree block is also called atrial ventricular disassociation. The danger of these high degree blocks should be obvious. Ventricular contraction will not always be preceded by an atrial contraction. Hence, the ventricles are not guaranteed to contain enough blood for a detectable contraction. Clinical treatment for high degree heart blocks can be pharmaceutical or invasive. Autonomic drugs such as atropine can be used to inhibit vagal stimulation and increases the bradycardic rates typically associated with heart blocks. If conduction is not improved with medication, artificial pacemakers can be installed installed to stimulate either the atria, the ventricles, or both in a synchronized rhythm. Now, it's important for the NCLEX that we look at a myocardial infarction. What a myocardial infarction on an EKG strip actually looks like. So when you're looking at an EKG strip, the rhythm is usually a regular rate, 80 beats per minute, in this particular strip, okay? Well, no, I don't know about this strip. One, two, three, four, five, six, yep. So in this particular strip, we have a regular rate of 80 beats per minute, okay? The QRS duration is normal, the P wave is normal, but the ST element 
does not go isoelectric, which indicates infarction. By isoelectric, I've never talked about this, but the isoelectric line is the baseline of the height of a particular wave. All right? So the P wave has an isoelectric line. The R wave has an isoelectric line. This just means the baseline on your electric uh, on your EKG strip. So we know a person has a myocardial infarction when the ST segment does not go to the baseline on the EKG strip. And I circled on this strip the, what I mean by that. And you can see that there's no noticeable um, between the Q, let's see, let me see, between the Q of the QRS segment and the apex of the T, there's no noticeable ST element. It just slides into the next. QRST. You see there's no ST segment. This is the main thing you see when it, when you look at a strip you can see a myocardial infarction. Also if you look at this strip you see how the Q in the QRS segment we have the Q, the R, and the S. All right and then it goes right into the T. You notice how the Q on the QRS complex is inverted lower than the S. This is a sign also of a myocardial infarction. You see the T wave? I'm sorry, you see the, the Q on the QS, QRS complex? It's lower than the S. This is a sign of a myocardial infarction as well as the ST element. Now, in closing, we're going to talk about asystole. Everybody knows asystole. This is a flat line, all right? So the rhythm is flat, there's no rate, there's no QRS, and there's no P wave. The line's just flat all the way across. This, you would carry out CPR immediately. Now, in closing, let me just go over one practice question. This is a question that is a sample question that would be on the NCLEX. If you purchased this presentation, you would have access to more questions. 20 sample NCLEX simulated questions. But I think it's important to go over at least one of these questions. So, here we go. The nurse is taking care of a client on a teleunit. The nurse should first assess the client, exhibiting which of the following cardiac rhythms? A, B, C, or D? And the answer in this particular case is D, because this is obviously A, heart attack, a myocardial infarction, right? Remember, we talked about all of these earlier. Uh, a is an EKG strip of an atrial flutter. This is what an atrial flutter looks like. Okay. B is an EKG strip of an AV block first degree. Now look at B. AV block first degree is not is the least troublesome, so we shouldn't we would not see this person first. Okay. So A is atrial flutter. B is AV block first degree, and C was a super supraventricular tachycardia, right? where the P wave is often buried in the T wave. Remember what I talked about? So we have atrial flutter. 
we have AV first degree block for B and we have SVT for C so the answer was D. So this brings us to the end of our presentation for um, understanding and interpreting EKG strips for the NCLEX and I want to thank you all for viewing.